who's going to tell you all about a documentary. And the documentary uh, covers his quest to climb Mount Everest. I've had him on the air before, before the documentary was finished. And now it's available, which is why I'm having it on, having it on again to promote it. Um, he'll take us through his journeys in Nepal en route to uh, the Himalayas to climb Mount Everest. Uh, the, how many days do you think from the very first step you take on the excursion to get to the top of Everest, how many th days do you think it takes to get to the top of Everest in this case, which is typical? I'm not going to tell you right now. You'll have to wait and hear. It surprised me. Uh, also, uh, his name is Alex Hartz, by the way, and he's a friend of mine. Who, uh, I know his dad forever, and he's a wonderful guy. Uh, he let me... Dragon, what do you call it when you put on those that, that, those goggles and uh, you have a virtual reality? What are the goggles called? Or you know, it's a screen that you put over your eyes. You know what the name of it is? I don't know. Anyway, you get the idea. Uh, he he let me put those on for a three D version of this, and that's on the final ascent to the summit. Uh, he did get to the summit, and I. I almost passed out. It was so scary. You know, I felt like I was doing it in three dimensions, and I'm going to fall over into a crevasse. Uh, that's available as well. And last night, I, I watched the uh, one hour and, and 12 or 13 minute documentary from start to finish. Uh, the first part being how he got to Nepal and what happened in Nepal, and then uh, going up to, to Everest. You know, more people are killed on the descent from the summit then on their way up to the summit for reasons that Alex will explain. But he'll tell you how you can uh, access this, and uh, also he'll share with you the adventure. It's really amazing, and it doesn't have to do with abortion or transgender. It's not a political topic. It's just fascinating. Uh, so stay tuned. We'll get to that as soon as we come back from our bottom of the hour break. <laughs> Kimminski. This is Texas time. On KOA, 850 AM, 94.1 FM, and on iHeartRadio. Mike Rosen for Ross. Now, Ross will be back on uh, Tuesday, I think. I'm going to be here tomorrow and Monday. And Mike Rice was kind enough to fill in between 9 and 10 o'clock. I had a doctor's appointment, so I couldn't be here at 9 sharp. Uh, so as I teased in the last hour, as we close the hour, the topic for this hour, and it's not political at all, although everything is political. So someplace along the line, there's going to be a political element to this, but I'm not planning on getting into that. Uh, have you ever thought about climbing Mount Everest? I have enough trouble when it comes to descent, climbing out of bed in the morning. Uh, and if the elevator goes out in, in my building where my condo is. I mean, that's an ordeal to get up to the fifth floor. I mean, I, I wouldn't even, if I if I had to get up to the 10th floor, I'd move. Especially with groceries. Now, who, where's that voice coming from? <laughs> that's Alex Arts, who's my guest this hour. Alex and I have been friends for years, and, and uh, before that, uh, his dad, Gunter, and I go back uh, 30 years or more. Uh, Gunter's a wonderful guy, and, and his son is a chip off the old block. He's very athletic. Uh, what are your dimensions? Well, that depends on before or after Mount Everest. Okay, Bef <laughs> before Mount Everest. Before Mount Everest, I was 197, 6'4", about 4 to 6% body fat. Mm -hmm. After Mount Everest, I was 170. It was the skinniest I've ever been. I lost 27 pounds of muscle mass just during that expedition alone. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. Uh -huh. uh, this is what we're going to talk about. His quest, uh, which, by the way, is the name of the documentary, uh, The Quest. Nepal. Yep. Nepal. The Quest Nepal. We'll, we'll get a sense of the geography, which was very interesting. I, I watched the, uh, there are several versions of the documentary. I, I watched the gold-plated version from start to finish uh, last night. And it's about an hour and 12 minutes or something like that? Correct. Okay. Uh, at the very beginning, Alex is in Nepal, and he's trying to get a sense of the culture by stopping people on the street and engaging them in conversation. Uh, after about 15 minutes of this, I'm saying maybe maybe he sent me the, the wrong 
the wrong uh, documentary link. Maybe this one doesn't have the ascent. Nope, but it does. Uh, <laughs> what what percentage of the uh, hour and eight minutes has to do with the 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 ascent itself? Yeah, so essentially the first 18, 20 minutes or so okay. talks more about the cultural stuff of the country, the mm -hmm. Hinduism, the Buddhism, the communism, engagement in Nepal. And then we get into the 52-day expedition portion of climbing Mount Everest. And the reason why we did that was because Mount Everest really is integral to the identity of Nepal and also vice versa. So what a lot of people don't understand about Nepal, they don't know much about it at all. They think maybe Doctor Strange from a Marvel movie, or they think, of course, Mount Everest, but they don't understand or get to see anything about the other stuff. And so we really wanted to talk about that first before we led them on this epic educational thrill ride to the top of the world. Yeah, and that was very interesting, that part of it. And I learned a whole bunch about the politics, the geography, uh, the, uh, let's see, it's, it's Nepal and uh, Tibet and India mm -hmm. and China, they all come into play. Mm -hmm. And from the summit, you can see all of that. Stuff. Correct. Correct. Uh, I also throw this, threw this out as a tease. From the first step you took on the expedition um, after you got to the Himalayas, to the top of Mount Everest, to the very top of Mount Everest, at uh, 29,032 feet, was that it? That's correct. I asked them, the people who were listening, how many days do you think that it took? And I didn't, I didn't tell them the answer, and I'm not going to give it away right now. I'll let you get them there in stages. But uh, start, start with the, the way you got from your motivation to do this, how this went to the top of your bucket list, uh, to actually getting this thing rolling. Yeah, exactly. It was one of those things that I was sitting on the couch. I used to live in, in the Midwest in Omaha, Nebraska specifically. And I was sitting on the couch one day after a soccer practice and I saw something about Mount Everest. And I said to myself, one day I'm going to climb that mountain. And then out of sight, out of mind for years and years and years, then I'm sitting on a couch in Denver, Colorado, not watching anything about mountaineering. I wasn't into rock climbing. I wasn't into any kind of outdoor stuff uh, that's, that would be non-traditional besides volleyball and football and that kind of stuff. And then all of a sudden I'm watching some random daytime television. And then that recollection popped back in my head for no reason that you promised yourself one day you're going to climb Mount Everest. The next day I started because if I couldn't keep a word to myself, how am I going to keep a word to anyone else? And if I'm not going to try to fulfill a dream, what am I doing? So I started that next day and that's how the process started on the mountaineering side of things. And that's a long process. You know, I climbed Mount Rainier and the 14ers out here in the wintertime, climbed Denali up in Alaska, went down and climbed the highest mountain in South America called Aconcagua all for preparations to hopefully make this childhood promise a reality one day. Then when I was sitting on top of Denali, I was looking out, you know, over the, over the Alaska range. And I said, you know, I can't just do this, risk my life and spend all this time and effort to, to climb these mountains just to stand up there for 10 minutes or five minutes or whatever the case may be. I got to do something bigger with it. And that's how the quest came about. And then I said, well, why don't I merge a couple things together? You know, my love for filmmaking and my experience in that world with my passion and dream to climb Mount Everest. And so we said, okay, let's go, let's go make this happen. And um, we also wanted to pick Nepal and Everest as the launch title for this ongoing series because we wanted to prove that if we could produce it in some of the hardest, if not the hardest environment on earth, then we have a viable proof of concept for all the other quests to follow. That's how it came about originally. How'd you make your first connection to get this thing moving as far as physically getting to Nepal and getting up to Everest? Mm -hmm. The first thing I did was I quit my radio show. I used to have a radio show in town. It was an improv comedy show. It couldn't have been farther away from this, but those are the two things I really like is off the wall comedy and really educational kind of documentary stuff. And then I just said one day, okay, now it starts. And so then I started the one year training process just to climb the mountain. So I spent two to three hours a day, every day, seven days a week with no exceptions, no alcohol, nothing. I was highly regimented on that in order to make the physical reality hopefully good enough to make that climb possible. And, and again, you don't know until you go because of the physiology and all that kind of stuff. And we can talk about that if you want to. But I knew that I had to take that first step. And then I just committed everything to it. I put everything else on hold, the rest of my career, everything else to say, okay, we're going to climb Mount Everest and we're going to bring a bunch of cameras and teams with us to film all this stuff. Let's say Joe Smith is a... Wonderful athlete, he's in great shape, and he decides he wants to climb Mount Everest. 
Uh, what's it going to cost them from start to finish? Mm, if he wants to climb the mountain itself and not do all the documentation like I did. Yeah, just just a, a personal experience. Yep. Uh, anywhere from 45000 on the low end up to $80,000. And that includes airfare? Yep, airfare, you know, the two months, you know, of all the logistical stuff that you have to pay for, all the stuff that has to be taken up to Everest, you know, because there are no roads that lead to Everest. So all that stuff has to be carried up there by a human being or by a helicopter or a yak. And you also have to sign up with a tour company that's going to do you. Yep. Yep. So it's mandated that you go with an expedition provider in Nepal. And they, of course, then employ X amount of people on those expeditions, right? Uh, it brings a tremendous amount of revenue to the country of Nepal. And, of course, it's also something that's very integral to this time of the year is the climbing season. Now, this is now the centerpiece of their economy, isn't it, this it, area? It is. It's yeah. it's one of the three biggest pieces of GDP that they have, right? Agriculture's first. The actual second highest part is foreign remittances from workers that, that live abroad and sending money back. And the third is tourism. Huh. I learned something about Sherpas. Uh-huh. For, uh, for one thing, I thought Sherpa was a, a, a noun that had to do with uh, uh, the, um, um, the accompanying and the carrying of equipment and what have you, uh, but it isn't. What's Sherpa? It's actually, yeah, it's a cultural, it's an indigenous culture of people, you know, that came over from Eastern Tibet about 650 years ago, and they settled in the Kumbu Valley where Mount Everest is, and they are actually the Sherpa people, so... They're not porters. They're not climbers per se. It's just that they've become known as that because of the amount of work that they do on Everest and that they're aptly prepared to climb Everest because they live in that valley. I learned that the average income uh, in Nepal is $700 a year, U.S. dollars. And in the two-month Everest season, the Sherpas make $5,000. Even somewhere up, sometimes up to $30,000. Wow. So the Sherpa, they, they make, not only as you can imagine, just do the math there, that's a significant amount of annual income in, in just two months, but they're also highly revered. You know, they're almost like your rock stars, your NBA basketball stars in Nepal because of what they do and the fact that they go and they take on this, these arduous endeavors of climbing these big mountains. Uh, just a heads up, there's no way we can do justice to this in, in one segment, so we're going to keep you on for the whole hour. No worries. After our bottom of the hour <laughs> news, you can pick up where you left off. Uh, all right. How'd you find the group that you were going to scale the mountain with? So what I did was when I climbed Aconcagua in Argentina, I got to know this guy by the name of Ryan Waters, and he's actually based out of Boulder, and he has a mountaineering uh, company called Mountain Professionals. So we got to become good friends, and I promised him, I said, if I go to climb Everest, as I promised myself I would do, I will go with you, Ryan. So I chose Ryan as our expedition leader to handle all the mountain logistical stuff because I was there to film too, right? So all the production side of things, there's his own ball of wax that I had to deal with. So I let Ryan handle the logistical side of things for climbing the mountain. How many people were in your team? So there was a total of four of us in the team. We had one person from Norway, one from Turkey, one Brazil, and myself. And then, of course, the support staff. Your team was, each one of them was pre-qualified, yes. I take it. Yes, yes, yes. What did that entail? So uh, the guy, uh, Erlen from Norway... He was going for his seventh summit. So what that is, the seventh summit is climbing the highest point on each continent. And of course, Mount Everest is the highest point in Asia as well as the world. And this was his last one to try to get was Mount Everest. Uh, same thing goes with Gilberto from Brazil. And then the third person, Golner, she's actually an ultra marathon runner from Turkey. And so, you know, she runs 24 miles or 100 miles at, at a clip, you know. So you were a rookie. So I was a rookie. As far as Everest is concerned. From, yeah, yeah, as far as Everest is concerned, I was. And so technically, I knocked off two of those seven summits, Denali, highest mountain in North America, and Aconcagua in Argentina, which are actually the two highest or the highest mountains outside of the Western, in the Western Hemisphere, outside of the Himalayas. You know. All right, let's fast forward a little bit. And later on, I'll, I'll have you go into detail about how people can get uh, these various films that you've got. Uh, you're... Trek through Nepal and the people you got to interview and meet along the way. Mm -hmm. And you made some really great uh, relationships with people, didn't you, during the course of that? Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Uh, now, now we're getting close to going up to the mountain. Where's the first place you go and how do you get there? So the first place you go is you actually go to, to International Airport in Kathmandu to jump on essentially a little uh, puddle jumper, you know, like you would fly to Aspen or one of the smaller communities outside of Denver. Mm -hmm. 
And then you, that's the city or the village of Lukla. It's a tiny little village at about 9,400 feet above sea level. There are no roads that lead up to Everest, so you got to hike all the way in there. And you've got to carry everything or put it on the back of a yak porter or a helicopter to get it there. So you start for the nine-day trek to Mount Everest Base Camp from Lukla. You said the uh, runway that you land on <laughs> to, to get there is the worst runway in the world? It, it's statistically the most deadly runway in the world, yeah. And, and it's ironic because there not too long ago was another accident there in Lukla and it killed four people. So... When it's not you, smoothly paved. Well, it's, it's not so much that it's not paved well. It's just the runway is very short, mm -hmm. and you have to come around a corner, around a mountain, to try to even get an approach angle. And then the pilot has to dive down really hard, and then when he hits the ground, he's got to pull the air brakes, stop the plane, because the, the tarmac itself in front of this tiny little airport mm -hmm. is about the size of three basketball courts. So he has to spin that plane around and stop it before it runs into the side of the mountain. Sounds like Telluride. <laughs> <laughs> Isn't that on a mesa, kind uh, yeah, of, and yeah. you go over to the end of the world if you go, okay. All right, I've landed there a few times. I don't think. Uh, all right, now, you, you get off the plane, what comes next? And what comes next is that you start to trek. And so now you break up those nine days that it takes you to get to Everest Base Camp, which is actually sit, situated at 17,500 feet. So imagine that base camp itself is already 3,000 feet higher than any mountain here in Colorado. You know, so it takes a lot of time to acclimatize your body to that altitude. And it also is a significant amount of distance to get there. So you break up that trek in about nine days. It's, and there's no ice and snow there. This is just mountain dirt and rocks, Yeah, right? so this time of year it is. Yeah. Uh, because actually Everest's latitude is about the same as Miami. So this time of the year, that part of the world is actually, you know, relatively mild until you get really high up. So this wasn't a, a dangerous climb, this portion of it. Uh, no, not necessarily dangerous, but it is somewhat arduous. It's not easy. To... You've just called Uber or something? To... <laughs> yeah, Uber Yak. Okay. Can you please take me to base camp? <laughs> so that wasn't the most exciting part of the journey, but it's something you had to do. Well, and it's also very culturally rich. So you get to learn more about the Sherpa people, about the Buddhism and the spirituality of the Kumbu Valley, and you have some of the most amazing scenery that you can ever imagine. Now, along the way, you're getting blessed by monks and other prelates, right? Right. Absolutely. Tell us about that. Yeah, so there's actually one spot in, in a village of Pengboche, which has the highest uh, monastery in the Kumbu Valley, and it's also the oldest. And you go there, and you get blessed by the Lama there before you climb on Everest, and it's become a tradition that a lot of Everest climbers go and get blessed by this Lama for safe passage onto the mountain, because, of course, there's been over 300 people that have died on Everest, so it's, it's not uh, for the faint of heart. All right, what's the next level? So then after that, you then continue on and acclimatizing until you get to base camp. Once you get to base camp, you spend about four days of just getting settled in and acclimatized at that 17,500 foot mark before you start then doing these acclimatization hikes into the Kumbu Icefall and the neighboring peaks because you just don't go up Mount Everest, you know, in one sitting. You have to go up and down the mountain basically two and a half times before your third attempt to go for the summit. Yeah, that was news to me, <laughs> how arduous this climbing can be. And now it's getting tougher and tougher and tougher. Uh, you, you spend a, an entire day climbing up, what, 2,000 feet yep. or something like yep. that? Yep. And you've gotten there, and you got to go all back down again yeah, and start you go over. Back, back and down. that's all just to acclimatize yourself. Exactly, to produce more red blood cells so you can survive at those extreme altitudes. So going up and down like that is demoralizing, but it's something you have to do. Now that there's a, a guidebook, so to speak, an instruction manual on how to get to the summit of Everest, uh, when <laughs> Hillary was the first one to do that, did they know any of this stuff? Not really. They were chipping away at the altitude. I don't mean Hillary Clinton, by right. the way. <laughs> <laughs> they were, uh, Sir Edmund Hillary and Tenzing Norgay, the first mm -hmm. people that climbed Everest on May 29th, 1953, they were chipping away at it, and they weren't actually the ones designated to try to go for the top. That was more by default. They were the only ones left standing. So they were the ones that said, okay, if we're going to try to make it to the top this year, it's you two. And the previous season, the Swiss expedition got the highest in 1952 and so on. They kept trying to find new altitude records and, and, and uh, benchmarks to continue their way towards the summit. At one point, the temperature can be 40 degrees below zero as you get closer to the summit. But at various levels, various other camps that you stopped at, there were times when I saw you just sitting outside in shirt sleeves. Yeah. What was the temperature? You know, I, I call it freeze or fry on Everest, okay? Because Everest sits in this big bowl. You know, you got three massive peaks, Mount Everest, Mount Lhotse, and Mount Nupsi. 
picture the back bowl of Vail or somewhere, but a lot bigger. So you can imagine the solar radiation at that altitude and it bouncing off the snow. So when it's calm and sunny, the heat index can be over 100 degrees. So you're just sweating profusely and you're just getting roasted. But then as soon as the clouds come over and the wind comes in, it can drop 80 degrees in a matter of a minute. What percentage of people who are hoping to get to the summit, who start, get to the summit? Uh, it depends on year to year, but less than 30%. Yeah. Also, we're going to discover that coming down from the summit can be even more dangerous than getting up to the summit. I don't want to get ahead of myself too much. So how many more camps are we going to hear you talk about from where you stop right now? Well, from base camp to the top, there's four camps in between that are set up. And so basically you got four camps and the highest one's at 26,000 feet. Yeah. Now, are these camps where there are kids having color wars and playing <laughs> softball and things like that? Yeah, I like how they call them camps because they're really not camps. They're just makeshift places or the safest places that you could put your tents, you know. All right. So we'll get to the question of how many days it was from the very first step you took to the top and then how long to get back down and some other questions. Also, I want to ask you how much money of your own you had invested in this from start to finish. And I don't mean just the start of the ascent, but just getting the, the very idea transferred into reality. Uh, and a, a couple of others that were really, I mean, events and issues and, and details on this that were completely astounding to me. And then we'll have you do your promo and tell people how they can get a look at this. And it's not going to be free, by the way. <laughs> I guess eventually it will probably. Uh, you've, you've sold broadcast rights to various networks and things like that. But you've got a lot of, a lot of dollars yet to recover. Correct. And I'm sure you will. Great product. Right back after these words, Alex Hartz is our guest. Mike Rosen in for Ross. I'll be here tomorrow and Monday as well from 9 to noon. All right, the first half of this hour with Alex Hartz is all about his quest to scale Mount Everest, which he did. Uh, so that's the whodunit, right? Now, we, now you know he came back alive and, and well. Um, this has all been documented in a fantastic video, uh, actually several of them, and we'll tell you how you can get your hands on those. But his personal account on this is fascinating. And I got a tease on this the last time we had Alex on the air before all the production was finished on the, on the films. Uh, and I, I watched this 72-minute uh, video yesterday from start to finish. The first part of it has to do with um, his, the beginning of his trek in Nepal, the, the people he ran across, uh, learning about the culture, uh, and then most of it is this ascent to Mount Everest. One of the things that I learned, uh, along with so many other things about this, is that oxygen deprivation, and I, and I, I knew that this was a factor, but not as much. Uh, as you did the final ascent, you're getting, what, one-third of the oxygen that you would get normally at sea level? Correct, yeah. And then the final ascent it starts off in the death zone, as they call it, which is anywhere above 26,000 feet or 8,000 meters. And you're not using any breathing apparatus, right? No, I wasn't uh, at Camp 4, which is the last staging point at 26,000. Some people... Most yeah. people do. And matter of fact, when we get ready to, to get out into, out, out into climbing for the summit, which you do in the middle of the night in order to try to get up and back down before that next day's nightfall. Um, I wasn't because I was trying to see what it would feel like. And if in a, an emergency situation, how would I be able to react at this hypoxic, you know, environment? Because you don't want to be a hundred percent dependent on something that may or may not be reliable. And it only makes about a 10% difference anyway. So it was extremely hard to say the least, but I wanted to make sure that, okay, if all things go bad, I can hopefully try to get my way back down. With that kind of exhaustion and, uh, oxygen deprivation don't some people hallucinate they do yeah it's basically like a martini effect the higher you go it's like drinking more martinis or more shots and you just get dumber and slower and everything is hard to do just putting one step over the other you have to kind of tell yourself to do it versus normally it's subconscious right and so yeah everything you have to be hyper focused on three feet six feet in front of you at the task at hand. So it wouldn't be a good idea for Joe Biden to attempt this. Right <laughs> Boy, I, I wouldn't Given give his, his condition. I that. wouldn't give uh, him good uh, odds of trying to make this one. Yeah. Now, for the benefit of those who are mountain climbers here in Colorado and uh, who have a whole list of 14ers mm -hmm. that they've climbed, 
think of that 14er and what it was like to get to the top of it, and now put another 14er on top of it mm -hmm. and start from zero feet up that 14er. Right. You know, when you climb a 14er here, you're starting at what, 6,000, 7,000 yeah. feet. Mm -hmm. Take another 14er, put it on top, and that wouldn't quite get you to the top of Everest, Everest, Everest because that's only 28,000 feet. Right. And Everest is more than 29,000 feet. Correct, correct. And the thing, too, is what's weird about an Everest expedition is that you can work your way up, for example, doing 14ers, or in my case, climbing Denali, Aconcagua, and so on. But you don't know how you're really going to react until you get there because it's completely physiological. Your ability to acclimatize and how you adapt to that extremely hypoxic situation is physiological. So you don't know until you go. So you could be the best athlete on the planet and not get above 20,000 feet. And there's nothing you can ever do about that. And because the snow and the ice is shifting, uh, every climb is, is different. If you've done it before, it right. won't be exactly the right. same the next time. And along the way, you've got these crevasses right. that you have to get through. And you have these ladders, the ladders that are thrown across the crevasse, and, and that opening could be 15 feet, something like that? No, it could even be 45, 50 feet, depending 40. on... And, you know. and the ladders you're using are aluminum ladders that you can get at Home Depot for, what, 12 bucks or something like Pretty that? Pretty much. Picture Chinese or Korean Home Depot ladders tied together with fishing string. And they're bobbing up and down. So it's not the most secure environment. See, and you're not exaggerating when you say that. Absolutely. Now. As the, the longer, the more that you tie together, some ladders, we were five of them tied together. Mm -hmm. So they just start to sway literally over a foot up and down as you're stepping on them. So, I mean, it's, it uh, is not, again, for the faint of heart. A lot of people get the deer in the headlights moment right then and there when they have to and cross. And have to go back the other yep, way. That's get me it. out of here. And you're talking about top-notch athletes, but when they see that bottomless crevasse that's a 1,000 foot deep and the ladder swaying and you only have about a one-inch of purchase for traction because it's rung to rung, right? Mm -hmm. Toe and heel on each rung. They just turn around and they call it, and they call it a day there. Uh, if you slip off the ladder, uh, that's it. I mean, there's no... There's no hope. Uh, yeah, realistically, you're clipped in to these little ropes, but those ropes are more of a psychological uh, you know, safety net than they are a guaranteed physical safety net. All right, get us closer to the top now. How, okay. many, how many camps are you from the very peak of Everest? So uh, you work your way out. I'll give you the quick rundown. So you go to camp one the first time up the mountain. That's about 19,700 feet. So you go through the deadliest maze on earth known as the Kumbu Icefall which is all those big blocks of ice and crevasses that are constantly shifting, moving six feet a day downhill. So it's like sides of this building and the size of cars and houses just tumbling over and, and shifting. So that that's like Russian roulette. And each time you go through there, it's just like Russian roulette. You just hope you make it. So you get to camp one, you spend a couple of days up there, you come back down to base camp. The next time you go up on the rotation, you try to tag about 23,500 feet, which is up on camp three. So you go to camp one, Maybe spend a night, go to camp two, spend a night, acclimatize for a day. And then you try to get to 23,500 feet on the steep Lhotse face, which is a 5,000 foot wall of ice. There's a little camp ledge. And the reason why that's the highest you go before going all the way back down and trying to go back for the summit is because that's the highest your body can acclimatize. Your body's not going to produce any more red blood cells above that. So there's no reason to go any higher until you go for the summit. And then the third time, based on the monsoons and weather conditions, is when you head for the top. And your last staging point is the Camp 4 at 26,000 feet. But then you got to go another 3,000 feet to the summit and back down. And you got to do that within a day, day and a half, because you can't stay up in the death zone for more than a day and a half, two days max, no matter who you are, you're going to die. The little tents that you would stay in overnight, mm -hmm. what heats the tent? You. <laughs> Literally, your body heat heats the Isn't, tent. There's no thermostat? No, there's nothing there to, to keep it warm and the solar radiation coming through from the sun. Yeah, you don't have a little, you know, kerosene. Yeah, a little and, tiny heater. <laughs> no, <laughs> none of that. No. All right, you got uh, a twenty or forty below sleeping bag that you that you sleep in. Okay, and and you're in the tent overnight. You're mm -hmm. trying to get a few Z's. How's the television reception? It's it's it couldn't be better because you're so high up, closer to the mm -hmm. satellites, you know, flying around the world. <laughs> Did you carry a big eighty inch screen to watch the Super Bowl? One hundred percent. You got to have some downtime. Mm -hmm. <laughs> All right, as I'm watching this, uh, including the virtual reality experience you gave me with that thing over my, my eyes. Uh, and I'm watching you uh, labor your way up, mm -hmm. especially uh, the last, how many feet, what's the final ascent to get to the very peak? Yeah, the final ascent from Camp 4 to the summit is 3,000. 3,000 feet. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right, so now you're within, oh, 200 feet of yeah. the summit. I'm, I'm watching this. Mm -hmm. 
first thing that surprised me was on your way to the top, there's a, a rope that's coming down from the top and, and you're kind of, that rope is helping you hand over hand uh, get to the top. How the hell did the rope get there? Yeah, it's it's a these are lines that are set in by a climbing team that are picked from all the different expeditions. Yeah. They'll pick one guy from this team, this team, this team, and that that's the summit rope team. And because you were leading the way, there was nobody in front of you. Right? Yeah, uh, okay. yeah. I had the whole upper mountain to myself mm-hmm. with only one other person, which mm-hmm. is of course unheard of, and had the whole summit to myself with only one other person for forty five minutes. So it was something you could never plan a thousand times to turn out that way. But yeah, they set these lines, right? Because you're talking about when you're going about 200 feet away, you're by the Hillary Step and the Corners Traverse, which is, you know, about a 13,000 foot drop off into China or or Tibet to your right and about seven and a half thousand feet back in Nepal to your left. And it's only 18 inches wide. So these safety lines that you clip into, um, you use to try to jumar or to shimmy your way up. And those are put in by a summit rope team where their only job is to guide a rope up to the summit. And they take turns working that rope up and down the mountain, you know, to try to get it to the top. And you say that that rope is um, put in at the beginning of the two-month climbing season. Correct. Right. And do they remove it at the end of the two month climbing no, season? No, they don't. Uh-uh. Does it stay there or it, does it disappear it, it, after? It stays there and it disintegrates over time. Yeah. So you'll see ropes from previous years as well as even way further back than that, but it deteriorates because of how powerful the sun rays are up there, how bad the wind is, you know, the wind speed and, and the temperature changes and so on. Yeah. So when Hillary got to the top, there wasn't any rope moving no, for no, him. Him and Norgay were the first. Yeah, they were the first. So they were just blindly leading up there, you know, hoping that, okay, around this corner above this step where they aptly named the Hillary Step mm-hmm. and to get to the summit slope that eventually that they get to the summit, yeah. So I was very impressed watching this uh, at your endurance and your strength uh, to get up there. And it occurred to me, wait a second, I'm watching a video of this. <laughs> Somebody's shooting the video. This is the guy doing all the work. How much does that camera weigh? Uh, that was actually a very small camera because okay. we had two of us filming. I was filming and then someone else was filming in return. Mm-hmm. And those were little tiny, you know, actually handheld cameras because up there carrying anything heavy is not an option. Okay. So the camera wasn't t- taking a, a telescopic uh, shot from the base camp. I mean, he was right there within arm's reach of you. Almost. Yeah, exactly. Down at base camp, we had more of a team. We had, you know, five or six cameras down there. And as we got higher in the mountain, we got less and less because of, again, the logistics of it you know, charging it, keeping them warm, getting them to even, even to operate, and then the weight, you know, to be able to actually carry it all the way to the summit and back down. Because, again, it was me and another person filming, you know, from the summit day. How long did you spend, spend at the summit? 45 minutes. Really? Yep. Yeah, yeah, all by myself with one other person. And so one of the first things I did when I got up there, I looked down to the other side. The other main way up is through China or Tibet. And there's no coordination between what expeditions on the Chinese side and the Nepalese side do. So you could have a lot of people up there. You could have nobody up there or vice versa. I got up there. I looked down the other side and nobody was coming up. And I looked back at Tashi and I said, I can't believe I was the whole summit of Mount Everest to ourselves. And we it just had a very amazing, of course, dangerous moment for about 45 minutes up there. Did you bring a magazine or something? Yeah, so you know, it's a great to place to lay out and, and get some sun. What happens if you have to go to the bathroom? Uh, yeah, usually your digestive system completely shuts down anyway. You're so dehydrated that, you know, doing a number one is not usually an option. A number two doesn't happen for days because you can't keep it in your system. So, but if you did, technically you'd have to uh, either go in your down suit or find a way to extract it from that down suit. Now, this is the most amazing part of it. Alex, from this very sup, skied all the way down to the base <laughs> camp at the very bottom of the mountain. That's amazing. <laughs> Thanks for the kind words, but unfortunately, I did not do that. <laughs> you didn't do that. <laughs> now, tell us about the videos and how people can get them. Yeah, okay. So essentially, the Quest Nepal, which is what you saw last night, you were one of the first people to see that. That releases across North America, all throughout North America on May 24th. And so it's going to be, um, you know, on multiple platforms and channels in North America, United States, and Canada on May 24th. And it's now actually available for pre-sale, exclusive pre-sale on Apple TV and iTunes until the 24th. So if you wanted to either get it now to have it before the 24th or get more information, watch the trailer and so on about the Quest Nepal, you can go to thequestnepal.com. Again, that's thequestnepal.com. 
That'd be the best way. At some time in the future, is this going to be on the National Geographic channel or something like that? Yeah, it's hard to say. We don't know. We know that we have a release on multiple platforms come the 24th. And again, like I said, the exclusive pre-sale right now on Apple TV and iTunes. And then it goes from there. So typically what will happen is you'll have it on these launch platforms. And then it'll start to morph into subscription-based platforms as well. That's your Hulus, your Disneys, and so on, Netflix, and so on. So we'll see what happens. But we know we have a massive uh, nationwide and Canadian-wide release on the 24th. Now, I teased this uh, over an hour ago. (laughs) Throwing out the question, from start to finish, how long does it take to get to the summit? And uh, a couple of people here in the studio I asked, and they didn't get close. They're thinking, you know, a week, uh, 10 days. Mm-hmm. Uh, they didn't realize that for acclimatization, you, you gain 2,000 feet. Wow, great. Now go back down because you're only doing this to acclimatize. You're going to mm-hmm. do it again and again and again. How many days from start to finish to get to the summit? 52 days. Wow. 52 days, yeah. So it takes nine days to trek to base camp, and then from base camp to the summit and back is another 43 days. 52 days. Yes. Now, of course, you skied all the way down, so you probably did that in just a couple of hours. Yeah, I shaved off some time. (laughs) I was also surprised to see how you came all the way down, and frankly, very disappointed. (laughs) You didn't exactly go by Uber, but helicopter came and picked you up. You also, what happened was, you go back to base camp, so you have to go up and down from base camp to base camp to be a summit. But what we wanted to do is we wanted to film the topography and that whole distance from Kathmandu, where you started, where I started from to Everest and back. So we took from base camp a helicopter back to Kathmandu so we could film all that uh, you know, change in topography as well as what the scenery looks like from the lowlands at 5,000 feet in Kathmandu or 4,600 feet all the way up to 17.5 at Everest Base Camp. So for people who do have that device that you put over your eyes to do a virtual reality mm-hmm. and you have a 360 degree virtual reality in 3D yep. that you... you um, treated me to, what, a year ago? How yeah, long was that? Yeah, gave you some sample footage of it, yeah. Uh, and I was scared, and I felt like I was going to fall over and die, <laughs> and I was dizzy and disoriented. Yeah. I had to brace myself. Yeah. That's how realistic it is. Is that available too? Well, so yeah, it will be available. Mm-hmm. So we have essentially three productions that came out of this. The one that launches on May 24th, The Quest of Nepal, that 72-minute documentary that you saw and that's available on Apple TV and iTunes right now. And then later on, somewhere between June and August, the Quest Everest documentary and the Quest Everest VR experience of what you're talking about in virtual reality will be released uh, simultaneously as well. So you can get the first ever first person ascent of Mount Everest in virtual reality. So it's the closest thing to climbing the mountain without being dumb enough to get off the couch and trying it yourself. Will you do Everest again sometime? I don't think so. But we are going to do Been more. There, done that. Yeah, we're going to do more quests because this is an ongoing series. So we're going to do more of these quest documentaries and virtual reality films mm-hmm. as well. Um, and so we've got the next ones uh, laid out. And so what we're going to do now is release the Quest Nepal and then those other iterations of it throughout the summer. And then we'll start planning on where we're going to go next. Now, are you going to do a guest spot on, on the Today Show or something like that for some if, national exposure? If they would have me, I'd be glad to for sure. Well, they should. What a what a phenomenal story this is. And they can even show some of the film, too. Yeah, and I can even put some virtual reality headsets on them to even give them, you know, a snid bit of what the Quest Everest VR experience is going to be like. Mm-hmm. So you put something like $200,000 into this from start to finish, and now maybe some of it's coming back. And that is the hope. And uh, more importantly, what's what really matters to me is that the most amount of people around the world get to experience this because I understand that 99.9% of the population will never have this opportunity to A, climb the mountain, and to B, to experience what it's like to climb this mountain. So that, to me, is what matters the most, actually. At any point in your ascent, did you think you'd have to stop and quit? Yeah, there's a lot of times. It's a constant battle of yes and no, right? It's yes and or no but scenario that you're constantly fighting with yourself all the time. But when you get to certain points on the mountain, especially since I knew that I was doing this for a production or multiple productions, there was uh, no op- there was no other way that this was going to turn out with the exception of either I come back down with 63 hours of footage or I might be number 306 and no one ever sees me again. I think if you didn't make it to the top, that was the cherry on top mm-hmm. of the whipped cream, uh, it would have blunted the impact of this. Yeah, and it probably would have beat me up pretty good because, again, I'm, I'm somewhat of a type A kind of guy and everybody that goes to try to climb ever is. So it's definitely something that, you know, would, would stick with you. But I'm humbly honored to have done so. I still got 10 fingers, 10 toes. 
um, despite some of the other things like losing 27 pounds of muscle mass and having nerve damage in my feet. Outside of that, I'm fine. It's three feet from my heart. I'll live. Anything permanent? Uh, maybe some of the nerve damage in my toes, but again, there's benefits to it. I can kick a wall and it doesn't hurt so bad. <laughs> <laughs> Alex Hartz, our guest. It's called The Quest Nepal. And again, you can go to Apple TV, and over time, it'll be in all kinds of places. Yes, right? the best way to go about it is go to thequestnepal.com. You can see the trailer there. You can see all the different platforms as it's launching, and you can order the pre-sale on Apple TV and iTunes if you're so inclined to do so. Okay, thanks so much. All right, that wraps it for today. I'll be back tomorrow filling in for Ross starting about 9 o'clock.